Well, good morning. As I look at my first slide, I'm a little worried. I don't know how I ended up off kilter there. I, I apologize for the uh, poor first impression. They were centered last night, but that was before two beers, three beers. Um, anyhow, <laughs> very humbling to be in a big room full of uh, lots of smart people. The topic of requirements has been mentioned a couple of times. I know Alan with the Wireless LAN Advisory Board. Um, I know that's one of their main thrusts. It came up in a couple of other topics. I don't profess to come up here and, and talk at you and, and tell you anything about you know, how you ought to be doing requirements. This is more in the context of I've been doing wireless for a long time. I interface with vendors. I do a lot of different um, things. And the whole notion of gathering requirements isn't always that easy. And this is really kind of sharing my perspective more so than, than teaching you anything or lecturing. So hopefully you can uh, appreciate where I'm trying to go with this. <clears throat> From the um, session build up, this is what I promised you. Basically, it's easy to, I realize that this looks small from here. I'm sorry if anybody can't read that. Um, now that I'm standing here, I realize how small it looks. Basically, I'll, I'll summarize. It's easy to talk about gathering requirements. Everybody understands the importance, at least the face value of, of gathering requirements. But you know what you gather today may not be valid tomorrow. This whole notion of you know, you got to start from something and build on it, and you know that that's the the first step is always gathering requirements. It sounds so innocuous and so easy, but it isn't always that way. And where I'm coming from, you know, yes, I am the world's most interesting man. I get that, <laughs> but at the same time, these are the specific things that have shaped my perspective. Again, I won't bore you with reading uh, each and every bullet. But by day, I do design and run um, big and small networks. Uh, my day job is for Syracuse University. I'm the campus wireless network architect. Um, I've been doing networking for almost 20 years. 15 of that has been in wireless. I also wear a media hat. I've been uh, freelance writing for a number of outlets for many, many years. I, I'm getting old and I realize it. Um, Doing that lets me see vendors' perspectives, even if I don't particularly get to use their gear, I get to at least hear what they're thinking, and that you know provides me with a lot of food for thought. I teach, I write, I do a bunch of different things. I come at this notion, of, and I also have my own small company, and I have my own small customer base, so at times I'm a customer, at other times I'm the provider. So all of this kind of, gives me um, the perspective that I'm about to share with you. you know, not, not bragging here, just letting you know what has kind of formed what I'm about to share. So why did I want to do this topic at this particular conference? Again, back to what I led with, everyone in the room is likely versed on the importance of gathering um, requirements. It's kind of like every wireless training you'll ever get into that's you know the first or second page if it's not in the preface, right? It's just, it's inescapable. If you're not gathering requirements, you, you kind of failed right off the bat. <clears throat> but we all have different ideas, or at least people I've talked to, I've heard different ideas of what gathering requirements means. You know, so the questions that I find, you know, come up in my mind, you know, what requirements are we even talking about? How deep into the overall network integration do you go? We're talking about wireless networking. Do you go deeper into the network? Or are you just, li are you just living in the RF um, part of it? Is good RF enough? Is that pretty much the end of what you need to do? And granted, there's a lot of different situational nuance. And we'll talk about that as we go. But um, you know, sometimes it's easy to get kind of over-focused on RF and other things start to suffer. And then the last bullet, I ask, have you ever been the vendor or the customer talking a different language from the person across the table from you? I can't tell you how many times through the years I've sat down, usually 
I'm the customer in this situation where I've sat down with a vendor and the first thing they say is, this is what you need to do. And I'm waiting to hear, what is it that you're trying to accomplish? What is your current environment? This is what you need to do. And up come the slides and, well, you know, we don't have that, we don't have that, we don't believe in that. That's, are you even in the right place? You know, is this for a different organization, whatever it is you're, you're trying to show us there? Um, so when I put on the other hat and I'm actually the person in that vendor role, I, I try to be very mindful of all of the times where that has happened and it's, it's just very uncomfortable. It's like you come at me with your, your preconceived notions and you know, how you do things and it, it doesn't really fit me and you're telling me what my requirements are instead of asking and, and that doesn't work. Does that ring familiar? Anybody? <clears throat> also, the notion of you know, shelf life on the requirements. It's easy to gather up a bunch of information, you know, you do a good job, maybe you've got a checklist, you go down, you know, it's kind of ceremonial, yup, did that, did that, did that. And now you've got your checklist, you walk away, you incorporate that into system design. Again, the answer is gonna vary, like everything in wireless, it's been said before, the answer is, it depends. Well, how long are those requirements good for? It depends. It might be a year, it might be 10 years, it might be two hours, depending on the environment. Then what happens when they change? What's the impact on the whole process, the whole you know, design um, process and philosophy? What if the requirements, what if some requirements got left out of the sacred gathering ceremony, right? I've sat down with people, again, that work off a checklist, or you can feel that they're just going off a script. Okay, we do this because it's ritual. Let's gather requirements together. Okay, we got about 30 minutes, boom, 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 did that, check it off, move on to the next thing. But it was kind of empty and kind of hollow. And then it turns out afterwards, okay, maybe some very, very important stuff got missed, and how do you come back and deal with that? <sighs> the notion of customer requirements don't always meet the VAR or the vendor's requirements. Again, I've, I've worn both hats, I do wear both hats. A lot of times back to the vendor, the VAR telling you as the customer, this is what you gotta do. Okay, well that, that sounds like your requirements, it's not mine. How do we reconcile these? Sometimes one party or the other has no interest in reconciling them. It's my way or no way. How do you deal with that? And then there's the delta between marketing and reality that we all have to put up with. You might have a customer that's been brainwashed by marketing. This is what I, I have to get. You're gonna give me a solution that does the unattainable. Okay, um, yeah, let's talk about that. So, <laughs> this is where it can go wrong. Right, if the requirements process is handled poorly, let me give you a little bit of help. Hope, do we have audio here? We're gonna invoke Adrian and Kate to help us out. Uh-oh. That was Adrian for a minute, for a second. It's coming out of some speaker somewhere. Okay. Is it not worth playing? Can you not hear anything? Uh, okay. Let me give it a try. Our new wireless LAN is connected to my LAN that's connected to critical core services that may or may not be in good shape, but people rely on them. And those people use our wireless LAN the way they need to use it, not the way we might expect them to use it. And maybe what they need to do doesn't fit our tidy little bag of expectations, and the way they use it likely depends on their own reality, not ours. And for sure that reality is also connected to the internet. 
and maybe some stuff over the wireless or the wide area network and we'll have a security component or two that maybe we had a hand in shaping. And if we didn't shape them right or if the internet pipe is too small or if we didn't understand the reality that we were hooking our kick-ass wireless design to, then maybe the customer will not be happy because everything they do on the wireless network will feel sucky and they will say, my goodness, those heat maps the wireless folks gave me are quite swell for sure, but the actual network isn't doing what it's supposed to. So I guess they didn't really understand what I needed, but I paid a lot of money for it and my TCO is going through the roof because I'm constantly on the phone dealing with user complaints in my left ear and vendor excuses for system crashes in the right ear, but man, those heat maps look pretty, so at least I got that to comfort me. They kind of look like paintings, and for what they cost me, freaking Van Gogh could have painted them. <laughs> and the guy said it's a really fantastic wireless network design, but then why does it feel so cruddy when I use it? And why do I have to change the way I do business to suit the wireless designer's whims? When he ain't the boss of me, what the hell have I become? Those heat maps aren't even that pretty and anyone could have done that hack job with a bunch of fat Sharpies and then took a picture of it. <coughs> Sorry. And speaking of bosses, now mine is getting pissed off. Oh geez, I hope that integrator company doesn't charge me out the wazoo to figure out whatever's going on because it never really worked right. Now I'm starting to hallucinate sharks and Yoda and stuff in those heat maps. I need a drink. I'm going out to my car for a while and turning my ringer off. Why should this be so damn hard when it just works at home? Are they just trying to get lots of billable callbacks for this nightmare? Nothing is easy anymore. I wonder if it's too late to join the Navy. <laughs> I need a towel. It's complicated, right? Oh, I feel bad. Kate and Adrian put a lot of time into that. So have you ever heard this sort of statement? It's really nothing to do with budget, the, the overall discussion. I just kind of pulled this one out because it's easy. They cheaped out. They went with a different vendor. Well, maybe you didn't understand that budget was an absolute, the budget constraint was a requirement. That notion of requirement means different things to different people. I've had this happen. I have $50,000 to spend. That's all I have. Well, the system will cost you 75. Let me back up. We have $50,000. Um, this is going to cost you $75,000. Okay, I think we're done here. Ah, oh, cheap bastards. Ah, they cheaped out. No, you're not getting it. Okay. So the usual stuff, right? This is a, this is a wireless talk. Let's talk about the more obvious requirements, right? We talk about coverage, density, throughput, all of the stuff that goes into building a wireless network. Wireless works at layer one, layer two, and that's where we're kind of at with, with most of what I'm talking about here. In other words, the RF part of it, right? And a little tip of the hat to Andrew if he's here. Um, his um, very famous capacity planner that we all know and love. Thank you, Andrew. It's a good example of the resources that are out there for helping to build really good textbook wireless design, um, yeah, designs to meet the requirements that you gather. It, it's good to have these tools that are out there. A lot of people in the room have written tools that help you get there. So let's talk about my big butt. It's okay to talk about my big butt, right? <laughs> it's the elephant in the room. Um, everything changes, right? Not every scenario is textbook. If you do have cookie cutter installations, you're probably, um, I would say, in the minority. I know like you know, certain big box stores or fast food or whatever, maybe those are cookie cutter and you get to do the same thing every time, but I don't, don't know if that's the reality for most of us. Um, I know for me, certainly not every scenario is textbook. Um, today's client devices absolutely are not next year's, and that's not just the, um, you know, what our students are walking around with, or our faculty and staff, the whole IoT thing. Um, you know, there's such a, a tide of devices coming into the networks that you have to decide whether you're going to support and how you're going to support them. 
you might go through the, you know, what again, the sacred requirements gathering, and, you know, a year later, the device pool on your network is completely different. Today's survey data, depending on the environment, depending on, you know, where you're working, your survey data may not be valid next week, it may not be valid an hour from now. Um, depending on how volatile your surroundings are. Certainly applications are changing. Um, you know, the best requirements checklist, if it's too skewed and too focused on today, the best, require, the best checklist in the world, um, you know, isn't gonna do very well over time. I know for me, in most of the environments that I uh, work in and service and provide for and design for, Because of budget and just because of the um, accessibility to the spaces and you know how we do things, we might put in a wireless design that has to last three to eight years um, with no chance of going in and doing anything. Finish ceilings, pathway, um, you know, pathway individual runs to each AP. There is no changing this. These are busy buildings, 24 hours a day and everybody knows that it's going in for three to eight years. And that has to be taken into account up front. And somehow you have to look forward and, and figure how you're going to build in enough flexibility to accommodate a whole different set of requirements. You have to kind of play the psychic a little bit. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in a bit here. So you can expend, you know, this is one of my points here. Um, again, I'll, I'll pull this out in a little bit. You can expend a lot of energy meeting laser focused requirements. And I'll tell you what that little asterisk is, the footnote. And if you're too tight up front, you end up doing a longer term disservice to the customer. And then the footnote says, but that approach can make you a lot of money. You know, if you have to keep coming back to changing it. I, as the customer, as the customer may have several changes to requirements um, in one life cycle for a given environment, and like I said, with no ability to really do changes as far as adding APs, moving APs. For some people, that's just the way it is. Again, that notion of system flexibility, um, to, me, that's, to me, that's a requirement for every wireless design. It can't be so finely tuned that I can't do anything with it. Like, okay, well, all of a sudden, you know, the room that had 30 people, now there's 50. Did I make my specs so tight in the beginning with the requirements that I'm just out of luck and my only hope in that room is to pay for some kind of costly change? To me, that doesn't work. I'd get fired if everything we did was, was that tightly um, done. Again, you know, more of this. So whether it makes your statement a work or not, I'm saying it's incumbent upon all of us to build in a little bit of flexibility. And if you came in late, again, this is my perspective, not a you should. So I don't want to lose sight of that. We want things perfect, right? Regardless of who we are or what we do or what our situation is, uh, all of us want things perfect. But again, back to my, back to my big butt. Life doesn't always work that way, right? I live in the world of policy-driven requirements, right? Sometimes I write the policy, I, I help write the policy, at least on the university side, that ultimately gets enforced by solutions. <clears throat> One of the things that I learned and I teach when I do teaching is, you know, time to go out and buy a, a whatever, a box. That box can do an infinite number of things, and you need that box to enforce your, at least partially, to enforce your policies. I mean, it kind of helps guide design. I know it's sacrilege to say it in this room, but I'm just gonna say it. Perfect RF isn't always the end all, be all. Um, again, coming from my world, I don't want to say that sometimes good is good enough, 
but sometimes really good is good enough, and perfection comes at a, you know, perfection can be unachievable for a lot of reasons. Money, money will fix everything, but sometimes there isn't enough of it, right? It's just the way it is. So, if perfect RF isn't the end all be all, why not? And I'm saying sometimes policy influences design in ways that kind of take away from that notion of wanting perfect RF. Um, that last bullet, the policy might impact design requirements in directions that we don't like or agree with as designers. And sometimes the results kind of stray away from best practices. I've got an example of that coming up. I've sat down with vendors that have heard what I need, what my organization needs, and the body language and, and the look on the face is somewhere between you are an absolute idiot and I hate you, I hate being here because of what you're telling me. Um, this is just not my script. I came into this room, I came into this meeting prepared to say these five things because that's what I say and that's what I sell you and that's what you do based on my recommendation. And what you're telling me doesn't fit any of that. I'm uncomfortable. Right. Anybody ever been there? Sometimes policy and best practices don't line up. Right? It, it can cause tension. Something has to give. I mean, in my situation, we're always willing to hear the vendor out. We're always willing to hear um, somebody who knows their stuff out. We don't know it all. We kind of live in a bubble, although we try to stay in touch with what's going on in every part of the industry, you know, for every part of the network, because we have a big, um, complicated network. But we also know that we're, we're kind of sheltered, and we don't know everything. <laughs> try as we might, so we hear the vendors out, and what are we missing, and you know, we kind of incorporate that into can we evolve based on somebody sharing new information with us, but at the end of the day, we go back to carefully written policy documents that say this organization has to do these things, has to provide this. We have to, I don't want to give away some of the ugly things we have to do, because um, they're coming, but we have to do things that some of you would look at and say, you never do that, that sucks, don't ever do that. Well, we're doing it, and we're probably not the only customer that has this sort of um, tension between here's organizational reality and here's best practice and the short path to network perfection, right? Situational requirements kind of dovetail with policy. Um, Everybody's situation is different, as I said. Here we get into the ugly stuff. So, everybody's favorite, access points in hallways as opposed to the rooms, right? Kind of, you know, kind of a cardinal sin in network design or wireless design, captive portals. Um, captive portals are yesterday's news. Nobody should be using them. Um, we have a captive portal. And there's a reason for that. That's part of our policy. Not every policy that we have that I've participated in do I like or agree with, um, but I'm part of a, a bigger group and, and we have what we have. The notion of too many SSIDs. Yeah, it would be wonderful if I could take our, I think we have four that everybody sees and then depending on where you are on campus, you might see as many as six. Um, it would be nice to reduce those, and we are taking steps to actually do it where we can in a couple of spots, but there are places where we just can't. And if I explain to you why, I have no doubt some of you would say, yeah, but you can do blah, blah, blah. And then we keep going back and forth about why that doesn't work for us. Um, Although we all know that the air would be a lot cleaner, there wouldn't be as much management traffic, et cetera, if we could reduce those SSIDs. It, just, it is what it is for us. Um, APs in less than perfect mounting locations. I have no doubt that I could give, Eddie's not here, I could give Hey Eddie um, at least a handful of examples 
that he would proudly put up on his BadFi website and say, ah, look what that idiot did here, that's BadFi. Sometimes we're stuck with it. And we've also had you know, vendors come in and you know, just put this in your DMZ, blah, blah, blah. Well, I, I don't have a DMZ for your thing. What else do you got? Well, it's got to go on a DMZ. Uh, I don't have it, and I'm not interested in building it. Well, our thing has to go on a DMZ. Um, can, we, can we change the subject? You're not, you're not getting it here. Again, more of the stuff that's a little uncomfortable, more or less APs than our tools tell us that are needed, right? I can sit down with my IB Wave, I can sit down with my Ekahow, and I can put together a perfect design, and then I have to take two of the 10 APs away for some reason. Or I'm gonna add four APs to the 10 that the tool tells me I need. And there's a reason behind it. But anybody who doesn't understand it would say, okay, why are you over-engineering? Why are you under-engineering? Right. The notion of indoor mesh, I'm not a fan at all myself, but sometimes it's unavoidable. I think I've got maybe three indoor mesh one hoppers that there was just nothing else to do in that particular um, location. RRM, um, yeah, it's its own topic. People love it, people hate it. I use it in spots and I don't use it in others and where I use it I control it, uh, try to control it, but at the same time I have found value in it. If you want to fight about it, come on up. Bring it on. Yeah, looking for Devin. <laughs> uh, sometimes you just have no choice but to support gaggles of the 2.4 gig client devices. It's just reality. And then the notion of, yeah, I'd love to take external antennas and use them everywhere to properly shape my, my RF cells and properly shape where signals go down a given area. But the architect said, no, I'm not fighting that battle because I fought it before and I've lost and it leaves scars and it leaves pain and I gotta work with that architect again. So, um, you know, the list goes on, the things that we generally don't like, but we're stuck with them. Um, sometimes if we want the work, we have to do things that we're not comfortable with if we're trying to sell work. I, I have seen people say, what they want me to do is so heinous and so against my principles, I will not take that work, and I guess that's your right. Um, but there's always somebody who'll do it. And I guess that's good for the customer, but. So back to the notion of um, you know, policy and situation, et cetera. On the left, you know, again, I realize that it's probably not crystal clear um, for some of you the way it's being um, projected up there. On the left is one of my own old uh, policy situational constraints. And I know just talking to one young lady at breakfast um, she has the same situation. We were able to get past ours. She's still dealing with hers. Way back when, when wireless was new to our university, um, we had no choice, zero choice, but to be in the hallways of our big dorms. So we made the best of it. And that's what the left is showing, is the down the hallway design. Um, you know, obviously you're staggering the APs, you're trying to give separation in the vertical plane, you're trying to do everything you can do, you're not just unleashing RRM because if you do, the APs being so close to each other with unobstructed view are gonna knock the power so far down that the people in the rooms don't get any of the, the Wi-Fi goodness, right? So we had to take those constraints and live with them and work around them and we still have buildings that are doing that, although we're upgrading all of them and changing that. Um, in the beginning we had to do that some of the, the policy requirements were you're not gonna be in a student's room um, for anything. And if you do, you gotta have an escort. And you're never gonna be there when they're not there. And you know, blah, 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 blah. And as many services that cannot be in the room as possible, especially if this is something you're going to be servicing a lot, can't be in the room. And then from the IT side, there was paranoia. We put these very expensive APs in the room, students are gonna do weird things to them. They're gonna tear them down and they're gonna steal them and take them home. Absolutely none of that came to fruition. Um, over time, 
we were able to prove that the reliability of the wireless was so good that there's no um, danger of putting them in people's rooms and needing to service them all the time. It just it became a non-issue over time. Also, the management side of um, the people who were doing the facilities policies, they moved on and new people came in that we were able to make the case. The wireless in the dorms is the main access method, whereas perhaps it wasn't in the original go-around, where there was still, you know, kind of take your pick between wired and wireless. Now that we're living in this new age and we've learned a bunch of stuff about how we do wireless, we want to do that thing on the right. We're more or less demanding it and we're telling you that we're going to have happier students if you let us do this. And they did. So it was an evolution. But what we have on the left was our reality for a lot of years and still is in certain buildings. Again, we're, we're working away from it, but we had, to, we had to deal with that. And I know from talking with some of you in the room, you look at that and you cringe and you give me a list of 20 things that just is absolutely terrible about that. And I know because I'm living it and we make the best of it. Moving out of um, policy to, for lack of a better term, I'm calling these longer term requirements. I'm saying these are, um, you know, kind of, um, again, situational factors that never get considered or raised until things spin out of control, right? To me, this is perhaps the most important implicit requirement that really never makes it into any statement of work. The system can't suck. Okay? It just can't. Sounds so simple. It shouldn't even have to be said. But so often, I've got really good heat maps. Somebody did that wonderful RF design. You know, look at this thing. We paid good money for this. We've got a beautiful survey. Why does it still suck? Why does it feel so crappy, right? Not only can the wireless system not suck, systems that keep up the system can't suck. Maybe you're not selling all of this, but you have to at least be aware of the ecosystem that's in play, right? And I'm talking about network management, radius, um, anything that is, has an active um, hand in, in people getting on the network is a potential to land on that list of things that can't suck. And what I'm talking about here is the notion of uh, total cost of ownership and hidden costs. To me, living in the cloud, I'm a cloud user and I'm a traditional you know, lightweight AP user and way back when I was a fat AP user. Um, with a foot in all of those worlds, I think that sometimes um, the cloud prevails for people because of this, um, the, what I'm calling TCO. When you get into hardware, when you get into management systems, and when you get into system components that become problematic, even when the RF is good, um, you know, all of that starts to make the cloud look really good at times. That's not to say the cloud is perfect, but I think that's one of the things that's helping the cloud um, gain favor with a lot of people. So, so there's measurable QOE, quality of experience, right? You can put out a bunch of sensors, you can measure things a bunch of different ways, and you can prove that out where the user sits, it feels pretty good. I do my iPerf, life is great. In the same time, I go to get on and something isn't right because that iPerf wasn't doing what the users do. I didn't have to authenticate, I didn't have to do something that the user's doing when it feels crappy. And the tools that you're using didn't have the same drivers. And the tools that you're using didn't just get updated by Apple with the latest iOS version that made something spin out of control. <clears throat> there's the things you can measure, and then there's the how it feels. And one of the implicit requirements, <laughs> as silly as it sounds, is the system has to feel good. People need to be able to sit down and not even think about it. So I put in a system, the last thing I want my users doing is, hey, I'm gonna run a speed test, something's not right here. Why are you running a speed test? I don't, it, it, it's not working. I wanna see 
I'm going to go to speedtest.com so I can blame you for something. Okay? Ideally, none of that would happen because it just feels good. So, you know, fast APs are nice, right? We have all these bake-offs. Um, not a fan of the bake-off thing, but we have bake-offs that identify which APs are the big winners, and there's a kind of a assumption there that if an AP is a big winner, that's the one that you should use to make your wireless network great. It's kind of a little one-dimensional because there's other building blocks that need to be considered. Um, even if your statement of work, even if what you're doing doesn't go that deep into the um, fabric of whatever uh, situation you're working in, all of this still comes into play. You have to at least have a working knowledge of what we're using for the network management system. Um, the controller, you know, PoE, onboarding, et cetera, um, you know, all of that builds up to how the, or contributes to how the system feels to the end user. All right, you can deliver the best RF design that's built on wireless specific requirements and the users can still be hurting, right? The credibility of that thing that you designed so well can be undone but what, by what I'm saying are the implicit requirements, right? Everything has to work, not just the heat map, not just the, not just the um, RF components, not just the, you know, what happens between the AP and the user, but everything has to be there. So, Probably obvious, <clears throat> what I'm trying to say through my dry throat, what I'm trying to say is the system has to work well and it has to fit in with both customer operations and their technical culture with minimum care and feeding, right? The thing that you put in there has to fit in with them, has to fit in with the overall um, ecosystem. It just it, if it doesn't, there's going to be tension, there's going to be pain, there's going to be fallout. If you focus on requirements, these requirements, while ignoring these requirements, you and your customer might both eventually lose. You might see that you did a solid design. The customer might think something else, right? Go back to that sound clip that I tried to play um, that didn't work. Great heat maps. Doesn't feel so good. Something, something's happening here because maybe when the system, the wireless part of the system got put in, there wasn't enough attention paid deeper into the network. And even if you're not responsible for all of the moving pieces, you're at least obligated to be aware of them, right? You gotta know what the lay of the land is that you're gonna be working in. I see a lot of wireless designers um, that do great work with Ekahau. I'm amazed and I, I admire people that can use the tools better than I can. Um, I consider myself good, but I've seen other people that are great and that, that's pretty cool. But a lot of people, when they approach wireless design, this is all they see. I'm gonna put together a good solid RF environment. And the fine print down there says, brazenly stolen from Ekahau. You want to make something of it, Echo? <laughs> you want a piece of me? Anyhow, and I might see it like this, right? And for those of you who can't read it, the, the building blocks, this is more of an ecosystem. I'm looking at long-term TCO. I'm looking at how that heat map design, how that RF environment fits in with the total network integration. I'm looking at all of the add-ons. How does it all play? I'm thinking about my daily administrative tasks. Is that good RF gonna be manageable? If I have to get in and, and find some important piece of how, what's going on with clients, can I find it? And what I find, is it gonna be reliable? And is the system that shows me that information gonna be healthy day to day, or do I gotta dedicate an FTE just to keep that up? And does what you give me with that nice little RF picture fit with my policy, and how flexible is it? If I need to make a change, do I gotta break out the wallet to pay you to do it, or do, can I do something because there is some flexibility built into the system? So that, and this, 
are two different approaches to the same thing. And if you fall into that trap and you're not looking beyond, I promise it's going to bite you. Not maybe in every situation, but certainly in some. And this is another way of, of looking at it. And it's just, um, you know, basically got to be supportable day to day. Got to be flexible enough to accommodate device changes with some evolution. Speed may not be the highest priority. The shelf life is going to vary room by room, app by app, building by building, device by device. It has to meet my constraints, not the VARs. I don't want it so finely tuned that it's fragile. I expect operational overhead I can grow into. It should work so well with the rest of the network that no one needs to think about it. I don't need another security headache. If we're looking at appliances that are part of the system, they need to be well maintained by the vendor. And I think I, I hit that last point yesterday. I am not the vendor's debug bitch. All right. That's the long term, you know, what, what's being sold here? Are you, giving, are you giving the customer, the end users, good RF and then a bag of headaches with it? And if so, yeah, to me, the requirement is that you don't bring me that bag. So requirements go beyond just RF, right? And I'm saying, sure, always. Um, wireless works at the bottom of the stack. But what if your statement of work is just to design the good wireless environment? And I'm saying, I got news for you. You're actually on the hook for a lot more. Even if that's all your statement of work is, um, anybody who's been in the business for a while will say, you got to at least have your eyes open. You got to think about everything else and know where it fits in if you want it to fit in well. So, through this meandering narrative, um, the takeaways that I'm aiming for, we don't always design wireless in a vacuum. What we do is part of a bigger ecosystem, right? The notion of a holistic view. I'm delivering to you good wireless. What does that mean? To me, good wireless means the client hits the access point, the access point goes to wherever it's gonna go for management, my traffic as a user gets to where it needs to be. If there's authentication, it just works. As the user, everything feels good. As the system administrator, everything feels good. It just works. It doesn't suck, right? That notion of the bigger ecosystem. Our designs mean different things to different people. And assumptions abound, even dealing with the smallest customers. I put everything on paper, I, I stretch my, my mind and my creativity to make sure I'm hitting all of the, the things that I'm delivering and all of the things that I'm not. Yet a week later, the phone still rings. Well, I thought that we were gonna be able to do blah, blah, blah. Okay, we never talked about that. Yeah, but I, I thought we could. I thought that's what these systems did. The fact of life. So the sign statement at work might protect you legally but it may not build relationships. All right. I don't know if um, some of you have seen the soon to be famous cocktail napkin drawing from way back when. Um, this was up on one of my blogs. You can't probably see all the bits and pieces, but this is everything from the AP to the internet and all of the hooks and the bits and pieces. You might only be delivering the top of that, the AP and the controller, whatever. But at the same time, you have an obligation to at least be aware of what the rest of it looks like for the individual user so it doesn't come back and bite you. And at the bottom, kind of our, our community mantra, every problem feels like Wi-Fi, but there's so much more to it. Good intentions, poor focus. Um, the fallout there, you know, if we, if we don't get the requirements right, doesn't matter what the game is, whether it's wireless or whether we're out looking at other, you know, kind of life arenas. Um, this is where football games are lost. Military battles are lost. Relationships are ended, right? People lose elections because they didn't understand the requirements of the voters, right? 
good IT projects crash and burn. Start off with the best of intentions and just not quite hit the mark. And when that happens, it doesn't matter what's in your bag of tricks. Um, as they say there in the bottom, you know, whatever you got for weapons, the best bottle of wine trying to get your sweetie back. Quarterback, football game, right? Best access points. It doesn't matter what it is. If you missed the mark on the requirements, you're doomed. So my recommendations at the end of all of this, right? Do what you do, the whole, the whole traditional um, one-dimensional, I don't mean that in a negative way um, when I say it either, but to me, the, the traditional checklist-based gathering of requirements, I kind of see that as one-dimensional if you're not putting any more thought into it than just the checklist. And I bring that up because I've seen it over and over. Um, certainly, that's important, but know that when you walk away with that document, it is just a point-in-time reference subject to very rapid change. Or it might be in an environment that doesn't change for the next 10 years, and then there's going to be everything in between. You know, some warehouses probably haven't changed in 20 years, and they're still, um, I'm sure, early 802.11 dot nothing stuff out there in some locations. They never changed. Other places are already going from 802.11 AC wave one to wave two. Just, there's a lot of variety out there. Um, so certainly traditional requirements gathering um, is important. Um, the way it's presented in so many of the wireless um, you know, textbooks and training blogs and all of that. But at the same time, I encourage you to zoom out to what I call 10,000 feet. Look beyond Wi-Fi and just make sure that what you're doing fits in what, what you're about to do in relation to Wi-Fi um, fits in with the rest of the environment. It's very possible to deliver something that's wonderful, and at the same time, it's not right for the situation, the bigger situation. Um, develop what I call the all-important big view, right? Don't, don't have tunnel vision, you know, echo how, echo how, echo how, echo how, echo how. There you go, done. Okay, there might be a little more to it than that. Okay, IB wave, IB wave, IB wave, IB wave. <laughs> Gotta be fair. So I'm saying flex your comfort zone without being a jerk about it, right? Remember that we're in the business of service. Understand that how parts of the bigger picture that don't directly concern you actually impact the environment. Um, the notion of empathy. I thought I was a curmudgeon. I, I've heard some of you in the room talk about dealing with your customers and whew, you put me to shame. Um, Empathy is not a skill that everybody has, or empathy is not a, a, a you know, um, natural gift that everybody has, but it's so important to try to you know, figure out the person that you're about to provide this wireless service to, to, to kind of have some empathy for them and maybe dig a little bit deeper, even if they're not identifying um, a need. You know, scratch the surface and you know, try to put yourself in their shoes and go beyond just the um, obvious. Wireless is complicated, right? We all know that. And it's only getting more complicated. The whole notion of 802.11ax kind of terrifies me in some ways because it's so complicated. Not that I won't be able to grasp it because my cranium is enormous and I'm just naturally smart, but the rest of you I, I worry about, right? <laughs> it's complicated and it's getting worse, right? So I'm saying don't make the complexity worse by ignoring the non-requirements or the not so obvious requirements that can ultimately bite you. Um, I find myself playing the role of the psychic, the diplomat, the counselor, right? Well, our last network did blah, 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 blah. And 45 minutes later, it's like, okay, well, we'll make sure your new network doesn't do any of that. Yeah, but I'm not done and it, it, it really sucked, you know? Unfortunately, we're not just, you know, there's a very human component behind what we do, or at least the situations I find myself doing wireless in, there's a very human um, component behind, and, and sometimes that's as important as just doing the wireless design for both the relationship building and the long-term success of whatever it is you're trying to do. Yeah, so the final words here, um, gather your requirements. 
Keep your eyes open to the situational factors that could complicate things down the road. The little voice in your head. Some of us have several little voices in our head. But if the important little voice in your head says, you know, I should probably make note of that. Yeah, that could get important later. Um, that's one you should probably listen to. And we may be technical authorities on wireless design, but at least um, generally, we're not in the business of telling customers how to run their operations. And I would encourage each of us to remember who works for who and adjust accordingly. Uh, Wi-Fi is fairly flexible, and as people, we should be too. Um, just a quick anecdote. Uh, my wife works for a, a hospital system, and they seem, again, it could just be what I, what I hear, and I'm hearing it wrongly, but they seem to be, um, they seem to have one of these IT departments. It's almost like uh, something out of a, maybe not quite Dilbert. You work for the IT department when you're in that hospital. They'll see you to fix your problem when they're damn good and ready. There, there's nothing servicey feeling about it. There's nothing customer servicey feeling about it. Um, every management, you know, how to be a better blah, blah, blah in, the, in your technical um, job books that I've ever read, they seem to violate. We need this. Well, you're not getting that. You're getting this. I don't need it. You got it. That's what you're stuck with. Okay. That's what we don't want to be because it doesn't work over time. I'm sure if she's not the only person to have this environment that she has to contend with, but um, that ain't us. We're better than that. That's all I got. Any questions, comments, thoughts? Am I wrong? Am I right? Yes. Do we need the mic? Can you hear me now? I can hear you. Uh, two questions? Sure. Uh, everything you've said has truth, and um, you've done a great job of mapping the iceberg. Question number one, do you think that there's a way to chart a course through these icebergs that is standardized for all of us going forward, a way that we can all uh, agree on taking into consideration all your points Consider this as part of your preliminary design effort. Uh, I, I don't know if I don't know if there is one way for that. I know that what the Wireless LAN Advisory Board is doing, the parts that I've seen hope to, I think, make some of this moot. But at the same time, there will always, in my mind, there's always a point where the technical here and now has to give way to your experience, your life view, and your ability to say, okay, we got, we got the obvious technical part down. What are we missing here? And that's conversation that's going to be dependent on each situation, I think. Second question, can you help us in the Wireless Land Advisory Board chart this path to... to yeah, that would be Alan. That would be Alan Klein. Uh, or Alan, uh, Alan. I've got, Alan, Alan. I've got Alan the man. I have his ear, okay. and uh, we were asking if you would be able to volunteer oh, yeah. some time yeah. to help us. Yeah, I actually got in on the, the early parts, and then I kind of got derailed with time, but I'm, I'm appreciative of it, and I'm happy to get involved. Thank you. Any, anything else? Yeah. Oh, well, you see. You don't need a mic, you yell. Oh, are you kidding? I be wave, I be wave, I be wave, I be wave. Oh, sorry. Take, take number two. Sorry. Take two. Echo, 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 echo. There you go. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you, Lee. Thank you.